slight delay. There was some technical problem. Hi, Janani. Good evening, friends. Welcome to this evening of Intax uh, program. A warm welcome to each of you who's joined us today, to members and friends of Intac. I have great pleasure in welcoming the speaker of this evening, Janani Lakshmi Narayanan Guruchiran. Intac, as you all know, is an acronym for the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage which was set up as a non-profit organization in 1984 with a vision to spearhead heritage, awareness and conservation in India and to protect India's vast, unprotected, built, cultural, natural and intangible heritage. So what exactly is intangible heritage? The, the term cultural heritage has changed content considerably in the, in the recent decades. Cultural heritage does not only mean monuments or collection of objects. It includes non-physical intellectual wealth, such as folklore, customs, beliefs, traditions, knowledge, language, and living expressions. All of these inherited from our ancestors and passed on to our descendants. It spans performing arts, social sciences, practices, rituals, festive events, and other practices concerning nature and the universe, including the knowledge and skill to produce traditional craft. Why? intangible heritage is fragile. This cultural heritage is a very important factor in maintaining our cultural diversity. It is this wealth of knowledge and skill that is transmitted from one generation to the next. Today we focus on one aspect of this wealth, columns an intrinsic part of the culture of our region and most appropriate for the month that has just begun, Marguerite. While it may at a glance seem to be an auspicious sign of welcome and well-being, simple to perceive and comprehend, it actually at a deeper level represents abstract concepts of philosophy the oneness of everything manifest in the universe, the unit, which is a part of the whole, magical motifs woven into the fabric of our very being. An amazing aspect of columns is its impermanence, the transitory and ephemeral nature of the way it's done. Some columns last for a day, some just for a few hours and some even just moments in a ritual until a pattern is created for another time and another day. This aspect of renewal means both change and continuity, just like life itself. We are delighted that Janani will speak on this topic today. To introduce Janani, she is a freelance writer and an avid column artist, exploring its nuances and indulging in this very calming everyday ritual as a means of her creative expression. She is a computer science engineer who switched career paths to foray into studying journalism and that opened her mind to a different perspective of life. Janani is deeply committed to parenting with ideals steeped in intersectional feminism. She's passionate about food writing, experimenting with different cuisines and tracing the origins of culinary traditions. And maybe that's for another session. 
Janani will today explore the significance of intangible cultural heritage of Kolam in its ecological, mathematical, philosophical, religious, and historical context, which makes it culturally relevant and will continue to delight and stimulate the interest of generations to come. Look forward to Janani's exploration of columns. A warm welcome to you, Janani, and Thank over you. to you. Thank you so much, Sujata. Uh, I'm delighted yeah. to present this talk on columns. Um, yeah. Without further ado, let me share this presentation. I thank Intac for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I'm waiting to share the screen. Yes, thank you. Uh, is the screen visible? Thank you. Yes, Akka. Is the screen visible now? Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you. So this talk is about Kolam, which is a perfect blend of art and science. We'll see why. I start with this wonderful quote by Chantal Jumel, who I believe is also here in this meeting. A Kolam is a painted prayer with the ground as the canvas, hands as the instrument, rice paste or rice flour and colored powders as paint. The Kolam draws the viewer into a world of divine symbols and mystical attributes. Indeed, it does. So what is a Kolam? Generally, a Kolam can be considered as a pattern of lines and curves drawn either freehand or on a grid of dots or pulleys that are encircled, encircled, looped or joined using straight or wavy or curved lines, all kinds of lines. It's also a Hindu tradition where women at the, uh, you know, at some kind of a threshold, they draw this art. It's a ephemeral art. It's ephemeral in the sense that it has, it is uh, something which has a very short span of life. It is drawn on a spatial threshold, meaning either in front of a house or a building, in front of the Tulasi Madam, or in the Puja room, or any space where a, Hin a Hindu religious ritual is about to happen, like a home. It's also drawn on a temporal threshold, which is the period of transition between dawn and dusk, so when darkness to dawn is when a column is drawn in the mornings, in the early morning. And again, when dawn changes to dusk is when it's drawn. Or uh, according to the Hindu calendar, we have the change of direction of the earth in the celestial space, which is either summer or winter solstice called Uttarayan or Dakshinayan. Now, Kolam is ubiquitous, especially in South India. And especially so in Tamil Nadu, when you're walking on the streets or driving by, you are most likely to see numerous columns on, in, the, in front of homes or buildings. Kolam is a tribute to harmonious existence where it is a means to feed insects and unseen beings or small birds, etc. Now, what is a Kolam? A Kolam is a design whose elements uh, include lines without dots or lines connecting dots or over and above dots and a geometry, a geometric freehand shape without lines or dots. And usually a column is said to have some form of symmetry, but not necessarily so all the time. Now, importantly, column involves concentration. It's something that is uh, that you can see where a memory is being used, our memory is being used, where uh, visual memory, which is iconic memory, semantic memory, that of facts or concepts, and procedural memory, which is the muscle memory. So when you're used to drawing it, your hand automatically adjusts itself to the curves and lines. 
and a series of disciplined hand and body movements with great dexterity and speed, which obviously comes due to experience. This tradition is kept alive organically, where you learn from practitioners, you learn from chat books, you learn with experience and observation. Kolam means to make highly intricate and complex designs that can vary according to events and days of the Hindu calendar. It's interesting to note that it's a regional variation of a pan-Indian culture. So all over India, there are regions where some form of floor art is practiced. The purpose, intention, and the symbolic value of this art is a unifying factor for all regions. However, the patterns can be distinct to the region and the community. It's called Rangavalli in Karnataka. You can see the different names that it's called. Muggulu in Andhra or Telangana. Alpuna or Alpona in Bengal, Aripana in Bihar, Satya in Gujarat, Mandana in Rajasthan, and Chaukpurna in Uttar Pradesh. Here is a beautiful visual of uh, Srimati M. S. Subhlakshmi drawing a lotus kolam with wet fluff, that is the Ma kolam. Why is a kolam drawn? Uh, I interacted with a lot of people who practice drawing the kolam. And I gathered this information from whatever they had to say, and as a practitioner myself. Kolam marks a spatial and temporal threshold. It represents wellness in the household. So we know that when there is a kolam outside the house, all is well in that household. When there is no kolam, it's also believed that probably the household is in a period of mourning or uh, ritual impurity, which is menstruation. The kolam is an illustrated prayer for forgiveness to Bhu Devi, the goddess of the earth, because we stamp on her and uh, we probably spit on her for, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, do things that are not really considered sacred, for which we ask for forgiveness. It is an invitation to the feminine divine, which is the Lakshmi Kadaksham. So when you draw the kolam, it is aesthetically pleasing and it's said to bring prosperity. It is also seen as a means of protection to ensnare evil spirits or to ward off the evil eye. A kolam, interestingly, is seen as a differentiating factor for, between a public and a private sphere. So we draw it just outside the house, where inside the house is the private sphere, and outside it is the public sphere. Kolam is an auspicious sign, which brings Mangala Karam. It is also commemorating a festive spirit or it's used for decorative purposes to celebrate events or festivals or functions. It's, it, the aesthetic appeal of the kolam is something that brings a lot of positivity. And uh, religiously, for Hindus, in the Hindu text of Manusmriti, there are five daily offerings for a Hindu householder, which is called the Panchayajnas. And one of them, called the Prahuta is called, is, it means to feed all created beings. So this is seen as a karmic obligation. A very interesting slide this one is, where we are looking at the origin of the design and history of the kolam. The kolam is a polysemous word, which has multiple meanings of either appearance of guise, beauty, where we say mana kolam, form, play and order, lack of which is what we call alangolam. It is a practice, th this practice of uh, floor art, as we know it now, of drawing in thresholds, these designs that we use now, it's not really known to be ancient, according to Gift Shiromani. He says it's approximately just 600 years old. Also, there is no mention in ancient Tamil word lists called nigandas. There is no mention of this form of floor art. Though it, uh, there are multiple uh, uh, words, uh, multiple times that the word kolam is referenced in the Sangam lit literature, but it doesn't necessarily mean this kolam as we know it now, or what we're talking about. The kolam can, uh, the yantras and the geometry patterns of the kolam, some of them are from the Vedic period. It's as old as 1500 BCE. This is interesting. Uh, the, uh, the Sona illustrations of Angola, uh, which is a storytelling form of art, it, where you draw designs on the sand, 
Uh, this from the 6th century BC, this you can see is a traditional Angolan Luzona, which represents a chased chicken's path. It can be easily mistaken for a sick column from today. Now, this picture that you see here is the Solomon's Knot. Solomon's Knot, the picture that you see here is actually a Roman mosaic pavement from the 4th century CE, clicked, from, clicked in the Basilica of Achilla, Achilla from Italy. Now, uh, the basilica has been reconstructed over a period of time, multiple times, uh, but this pavement has been left alone from the 4th century. So this Solomon's Knot is something I urge you to remember for we will see it in later slides why. Now, the designs, some of these designs without the dots, they can be traced to Jain temples of South Kanara in the Thousand Pillared Vasti at Mod Bidri and, uh, uh, and in Mahayana Buddhism. There, you see this is the Buddhist eternal knot. Uh, the symbol is used in a lot of uh, Buddhist uh, forums and uh, organizations as the emblem. And uh, this is a very, this is a very ancient Buddhist knot where you can see that it's strikingly similar to the Mittai Potalam Sipu Kolam that you see here. Early literary references to the word Kolam or to Kolam, the art form. One of the earliest is in Nachiar Tirumuri, where Andal talks about uh, the art of the, the flora. She uses the Sanskrit word mandalam. She says, Tayyur Tingalam Tirai Vilakki Tan Mandalam Itte Masi Munnad. In the month of Thai, I swept the ground, drew sacred mandalas, Tan Mandalam Itte. There's also the second verse uh, that says, Vellai Nun Manar Kondu Teruvanindu. Which means, I dress the streets with fine white sand. Later than that, we see Kumara Gurubarar's work from the 16th century where he talks about uh, the art of Kolam. This is the first instance where Kolam is referred to the way we know it today. Kunguvan Chandanam Kurambir, Kuraitta Tarai Mirigi, Kolam Itte. Where he talks about making a paste mixed with sandal and kumkum, and you smear the floor and decorate the uh, floor with a lovely kolam, after which you spread fragrant smoke. Prior to this, in Sanskrit literature, we have the Narada Shilpa Shastra, where the art of floor decoration is called Bhuma Chitra. This, while it doesn't refer to the word kolam, you talk about it's, it talks about categorization as dhuli, which is limestone powder drawing that exists for a short period of time, rasa, which is the paste uh, of ground rice and water that is made into a poem. It also talks about mandala chitra, which is patterns carved on the walls, ceilings, and pillars. There are also literary texts, uh, which are inscriptions uh, in 13th century, as well as uh, the Sri Sri Dharma Padati by Thrayambaka Yadwan, in which um, there is uh, mentioned about this design of the kolam on the floor. Now, coming to the components of kolam. What do we do to draw the kolam? What do we use to draw the kolam? We use kola marble. Kola marble is just pure raw rice flour. There's also kola podi, which is very contemporary, where we use a combination of raw rice flour and limestone powder. And there is also the kola mawa, which is the wet mix, which is stone ground raw rice paste. I mean, soaked and ground raw rice paste, which is the which is what we use to draw a ma kola. Then we have the kavi or semman, which is red brick powder that is used to highlight some elements of the kola. In some cultures, manjal is also used while drawing the kola. Today, we also use stencils and rollers made of brass or uh, other metals and plastic. And for Rangoli, we use bright, bright colored powders, which are either chemical powders or uh, if it's homemade, then perhaps natural colors. And then there are plastic stick on decals, as well as machine cut uh, plastic uh, shapes, which can be assembled together to form the shape of a column or the design of a column. What are the types of column here? I loosely categorized it into, in two ways, one based on the medium and one based on the design. So based on the medium, 
uh, there's the podi column and the ma column. Podi column is this either the kola podi or the kola ma, the dry kola ma. You use pinches of the dried flour. It's taken in between the thumb and thumb and the first finger, and then you let the powder fall in a dot or a continuous line. You see how my hand, my thumb is moving along the finger. This will enable you to draw different uh, shapes, or uh, they enable the powder to go in the desired direction. Then you have the ma column, where you use a small wet cloth. It's dipped in ground rice paste, and then the wet cloth with the rice paste is the the paste is guided through either the middle or the ring finger to draw the patterns on the floor. This is just like how ink flows through the nib of a fountain pen. Now, based on design, we can loosely categorize it as either pulli column or the cord column, nelivu column or the sikka column or kambi column. Then you have the padi column or the katta column. And then you have the mandalas, which are just freehand drawings based on some sort of a symmetrical pattern. This is interesting where we have two other cat uh, categories of the column, which is the Isai column and the Nir column. Isai column is where we have dots that represent notes. So from e for each transition between notes, we draw, we connect the dots. So when we sing, the notes, uh, you, you know, you tra uh, transition from one note to another. And as that transition happens, the dots are connected accordingly. As the song progresses, the appropriate dots are joined. And when the song ends, the column is complete. There is also the near column where oil is smeared on a flat plate with a rim. And then the column is drawn with dry rice powder. Then you pour water carefully from one corner until the entire design is submerged. And finally, the column appears to float in water. I remember the Neer column from very long ago as a child when my father used to draw this for Navratri. Unfortunately, it's becoming a lost art. Then we have the Pulli column, where dots are placed on the floor in grid patterns. These dots are either placed, as you can see, in Neer Pulli, which is straight lines, or in Edai Pulli, which is interspersed uh, between one another. Dots are the vertices that connect, uh, that are connected using straight, curved, or wavy lines. You can see here how one dot is connected to the next and to the next. See, so it, it forms a pattern. This, these are curved lines that are used, and then you have straight lines and other designs that can be connected, that can be drawn by connecting the dots. And dots are not generally visible in the completed column. So the dots are used more like a guiding uh, point. This is the pulli column. Uh, you have these spectacular pulli columns too, where this is the Shankar Chakra column, and this is the lamp column drawn by Srimati Hema Kannan from Mumbai. Um, I think this has a great uh, 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 prospect for um, giving vent to a creative, uh, your imaginative abilities. We also have so many contemporary designs in the Pulli column where you have uh, rabbit columns, butterfly columns. I've even seen Mickey Mouse columns and uh, Santa Claus columns recently. Then you have the second variety, which is the Chikku column or the Sikku column. In this Sikku column, the lines do not touch the dots. So what happens is, it is formed by looping the dots by a single continuous line or by several lines crossing one another forming intertwined patterns, as you can see on the slide behind. It involves drawing a line looped around the collection of dots placed on a plane such that these mandatory rules are followed. All the line orbits should be closed. So there is no line that is just left open and hanging. All the dots are encircled and no two lines can overlap over a finite line. This is the Sikhu column. It's also uh, the kind of column in which uh, several challenges for knots are executable. This is a simple 5 by 5 grid. It's an air pulley sikku column. You can see the, uh, you can see a few combinations. If you ask a practitioner, you're likely to hear that there can be infinite number of uh, uh, combinations for a 5 by 5 column. This is where 
we used computer science to um, predict the total number of columns that can be drawn for a particular grid. We'll talk about this in the coming slides. Here is a video where you can see a simple near pulley shift column being drawn. Now you can see how the grid is being drawn here. So there are two dots, two, four, six, eight, and then it goes back to eight, six, four, and two. This column is one where you use several lines, not a single one stroke. So you see that every dot has to be encircled by a line, so like a loop. It's a fairly simple column where there are no knots involved. And with practice, you know, avid practitioners, you can see that the lines will actually be straight. Also, the thickness of the lines is determined by the stress you apply between the fingers. So when you apply more stress, the lines thin down because less flour is uh, allowed to pass through fingers. This is a, this, it's, it looks like a shape of a tarim boat. It's also a very commonly practiced form. Now here we have the most spectacular Brahma Mudi, which is Brahma's knot. This, the specialty of this column, this is a Sikha column again, as you see, is if you begin the column from say this point, when you finish the column, you will end at the same point. That is how intricate the knot is. There are several versions of the Brahmamudi column. I picked two spectacular ones here. This is another beautiful column called the Ratna Kambalam. These are all old designs that you see in several pattern books. This is a 33 by 33 grid. And it's a one stroke column again, where with a single stroke, you see that all the lines are connected. You can draw one by one. And um, this is so intricate that this has been used to study a lot of computer science concepts. Now we come to the second part, which is the Padi column. Padi column is something like a festive or an occasion column where you don't have any dots for guiding the lines. There are several traditions on how a paddy column can be drawn. And you usually see that the number of lines are always even numbers. Then the, the lines are always interspersed with patterns like flowers or spirals or stars, knots, symbols, so many ideas. These are very reminiscent of step, step wells or uh, temple column. And a lot of these designs are actually prototypes for, are used as prototypes for architecture, even from the olden times. These are two beautiful paddy columns that you see. These are generally practiced, practiced in Iyer communities. You can see this, the Solomon's knot that I was talking about in the origin of column. There are four Solomon's knots that have been uh, drawn here. And it is so well integrated into the cultural uh, landscape of our column. 
This is a very typical Vaishnava style kind of colon called Tirupindi. You can see that this is kind of, uh, it is kind of similar to an Iyer style Padikolam in that the lines, there are even number of lines again with lotus and uh, other such similar patterns. But the center and all the, generally there are, you don't see any straight lines, you see a concave line. These are some beautiful columns practiced by the Nagarattar community. They are called Nadu Vittu columns. This Nadu Vittu columns are believed to be the harbinger of uh, prosperity and happiness. And all the symbols that you see in the used in the Nadu Vittu columns, they are filled with uh, so many uh, meanings and uh, inherent symbolism. This is really spectacular. These are some columns which are inspired by patterns from ancient times. This is the Shri Yantram or the Shri Chakram, and this is the Muladhara Chakram, where you see uh, several geometric shapes and it's gone by uh, these lotus, uh, lotus petals. You can see the lotus petal here also. Lotus is a flower that finds its way into a lot of column designs. These are ritual columns uh, called Navagraha columns. The designs are said to have been derived from the tantric work Saundarya Lahari attributed to Adi Shankara. And they are also used on a, on a daily basis to draw appropriately for that particular day of the week. Now we come to festive columns. These kind of columns you see being drawn on specific festive occasions. So for example, if it is Pongal, Pongal is a festival that we commemorate the sun god. So you see the chariot with the sun in it. And this is also a ter with the sun god. You can see the symbol chakram here. Um, and these are the Pongal panes, a more contemporary design. And you can see that these three are pulli columns, while this is a sikka column. You have the Krishna Jayanti, where Kolam is an implicit part of the festivities. The Krishna Kal with a Sikhu Kolam uh, uh, and a Krishna Kal inside it. And this is a freehand drawing. You can see the symmetry in this Kolam and the Krishna Kal again. And this is a beautiful Sikhu Kolam depicting the uh, Tottil where you welcome Devi Krishna. Here you have some Kolams for the Kartige festival, Kartige Deepam. I find that uh, the lambs add so much of beauty to these festive columns. It generates so much of positivity and peace to the surroundings. This is the splendor of Margari, which is renowned to be the column month of the year. Every morning you find that people are out on the street by dawn to draw spectacular columns. You can see this beautiful radial column, the round shape, with a pushani poo in the center, kept with some cow dung, as is the tradition for celebrating Margari. This is the Mailapur festival, Kolam festival, the Kolam competition that usually happens in the month of uh, January, at the end of the Margari season, just before Thai begins. Now we come to the philosophy of Kolam. Philosophy behind drawing Kolam can be a very personal experience. We say that Kolams are ephemeral. They have a short span of life. So every morning there's a cycle of birth when the creator draws the Kolam on the floor. And then as the day progresses, people stamp on the floor on the Kolam and it merges with the ground and dies subsequently the next day begins and another column is born. We can also say that kolam is a sort of a metaphor uh, to practice detachment. So when I create a kolam, I find that a little bit of me goes into that creation. Uh, I look at the kolam, I think that it's very beautiful. And then once I'm done drawing the kolam, I detach myself from the intricacies of it so that my life can go on with other things. And then 
as the day progresses people stamp on the kolam i cannot uh, mourn that this happens right so we practice it's a way to see this as detachment a kolam is also something that provides that that kind of reinforces that there can be infinite number of solutions to every problem that we face even in life so when you draw a grid and you start drawing a kolam you see that you imagine that you want to draw a certain design but sometimes muscle memory acts otherwise and then doesn't mean that it has to be seen as an error that is the philosophy you can actually change it uh, as and when uh, you start drawing to get new designs then you there's also a sort of a philosophy that believes that the dots and lines in the kolam where the dots stand for the ups and downs or the obstacles that we face in life and the lines are the course that life takes around these obstacles there's always an option right there is no a uh, space where a line cannot be drawn it's also a nice metaphor for connecting the dots where you connect the dots and see the larger picture gives you a whole new perspective a fresh perspective now here is the scientific aspect of the kolam we come to the mathematics behind kolam naturally kolam arouses intellectual curiosity through this branch called ethnomathematics where the principles theories the properties and concepts of this particular school all of them are steeped within ritual or artistic forms the practitioners the the interesting part is that many time practitioners are not really aware of the layers of mathematical complexities in drawing the kolam this comes organically and naturally from bodily experience and the bodily orientations there are countless one stroke patterns using simple elements and rules so we see that concepts of mathematics can be implemented here is a one stroke design that you see it begins here and eventually ends at the same spot that it begins then you also have geometric patterns of curved lines labyrinth loops hexagonal fractals about which we'll be talking about the prospects can also be applied uh, in uh, uh, more than uh, the, these mathematical prospects can also be applied to toys puzzles tiles which you can use to assemble different designs then graphical language architecture and city planning etc this is a very fairly simple geometric kolam you see how it is strong this is the grid that has been used you can see the number of dots per line this kolam is called as the shri kolam or the aishwarya kolam set to bring prosperity like an invitation to the uh, goddess of prosperity and wealth that is lakshmi and to kubera so this kolam when finished you will see that there are a lot of triangles that are a part of this when you look at a deeper meaning you have two triangles here that is a merger of uh, male and female energies as is widely believed to my memory this seems like a damaru shape so there are three damarus there are two triangles and three damarus that you draw and end this column it's fairly simple as you can see yes here you have different types of columns based on mathematical concepts the spiral column which begins and ends as a uh, uh, spring uh, we'll see the demonstration of one such spiral column this is a radial kolam circular in shape here you have a tessellated kolam where you have different tile kind of a pattern this is a hexagonal loop kolam and this is a square loop kolam so many mathematical concepts ingrained in this pattern these patterns this is the beautiful hridaya kamalam which is the you can see this uh, kolam being drawn now 
it's a very significant poem with respect to rituals and it's not usually drawn uh, on a place where people can step on it this hridaya kamalam is again an ode to the goddess lakshmi who's seated on a lotus so this the 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 dot pattern is pretty simple you can see that it is an imaginary circle here which is divided into eight segments the segment lines are drawn in dots and you follow a sequence let me rewind it for a bit yes so you can see that in this picture you see the way the dots are placed uh, imagining a circle here and you follow it's a single line where you follow this particular sequence where the first dot of the first segment then you proceed to the next segment third dot fifth second fourth and so on you keep following this sequence until you are able to finish the poem See that after point, it's the muscle memory at work. This is the beautiful Sudhir Kamalam. Traditionally, we write Sudhir Kamalam around this poem. This is the dried poem that you see. Now we come to this interesting part of the Fibonacci series in the poem. This is the part which actually amazed me. Professor Naranan, his he did research on the connection between poems and the Fibonacci series. The Fibonacci series is a very significant one in mathematics. you see the series here it's pretty simple how uh, the, the series proceed progresses this way 0 and 1 are the first two numbers after which the third number is the sum of the first and the second number the fourth number is the sum of the previous two numbers and so on that's how the series is constructed so take it roughly into this equation where c equal to a plus b where a and b are the previous two consecutive numbers of c in the series now there's something called a golden rectangle in the fibonacci series this rectangle of consecutive fibonacci numbers as sides so a 2 unit by 3 unit rectangle is called a golden rectangle likewise with 3 5 or a 5 8 5 by 8 8 by 13 etc this is the golden rectangle and you also have this important golden ratio which is the ratio of the sides of the rectangle where in the fibonacci series when you divide the bigger number by the next uh, the previous number in the series the ratio is a limiting figure of 1.6 it's not always exactly 1.666 but somewhere around roughly in that in that figure now this golden ratio is ubiquitous in nature where you find that in branching of trees in the arrangement of flower petals when you see flower petals there's always a symmetry um, associated with it which points to this golden ratio so you see spiral patterns of florets and sunflowers the spiral shapes on seashells it's amazing that this golden ratio is associated so closely to the growth process in nature it's also believed to figure prominently in western art in architecture of the pyramids and parthenon in greece and in paintings especially the vitruvian man by da vinci you have sculpture poetry music and this is quite controversial so it's to be taken i mean it, it, we just say that there's so much of association between art western art and the golden ratio now coming to the fibonacci poem this is built with fibonacci numbers and it showcases the elegance of this series we'll see how 
if you take a square of uh, side 8 it can be drawn using a square of side 2 and four golden rectangles of side 3 and 5 you see uh, an example of how a fibonacci column can be drawn it sounds technical but with figures you can easily see the beauty of it now this is the fibonacci column it's fairly simple to draw again, but we see how it is constructed. We consider any four consecutive Fibonacci numbers. I'm taking four easy numbers here. One, two, three, and five. These are consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Assign them as A, B, C, and D. Now, Professor Naranen derives that these two equations from the basic equation C equal to A plus B. I'll not get into the technical intricacies of how he derives these equations here. But let's just say that we can see how this equation is satisfied by this column. Now, this is a triangle, which is a B by C. I'm sorry, this, is, this has to be 2 by 3. So 2 by 3. And it's made up of the squares, 2 by 2 square, and another 1 by 2 square added to it. So this gives you the equation BC equal to B squared plus AB. You see this one column is a combination of these two columns. Again, this is another equation which is beautifully demonstrated by this column where you see d squared equal to a squared plus 4bc. Now bc is this golden rectangle. You see that when you add this square, when you intersperse this square between four of these rectangles, you get this 5 by 5 square which is a Fibonacci number again. You see how elegantly it's all coming together. Here. Where a 5 by 5 square is constructed as a combination of a 1 square and 4 2 by 3 rectangles. If you do this, this can be extrapolated for larger Fibonacci numbers and the result actually blows the mind. Now we have the concept of symmetry in mathematics through the column. Here is a column drawn by Srimati Kasturiwai. There you see that bilateral symmetry is very apparent, which is symmetry that you see when you mirror these two sides. This, this side is a mirror of this side. That is bilateral symmetry for you. This is, it's a 90 degree rotational symmetry in a column where when you rotate this column by 90 degrees, you get the same column. When you rotate the column by 45 degrees, you get a whole different perspective of the same column. This is a beautiful column, a traditional design called the Sahastra Dada Padmanam, where you see rotational symmetry. Every angle you rotate to, it will remain the same. The column remains the same. It intersperses with itself. Now we come to the concept of Fractals. Fractals are infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different scales. So when you enlarge this pattern, you get the same statistical character of the original. So you keep on uh, adding to this by making it into a pattern like this. So when you zoom in, the smallest unit will have the same design. This is a column that uh, depicts fractals for you. And this kind of uh, column, fractal column, is used to explain concepts of uh, progressions where you have AP, GP, and EP, which is arithmetic, geometric, and exponential progressions. So these kind of columns help us to study that. Now you move on to columns in computer science, where columns provide rich insights into the structure of picture languages. What is a picture language? A picture language is Similar to natural languages, it is made up of restricted set of basic units uh, and it has to follow a specific formal rules for putting these units together. That's a picture language. Now, picture language uh, is defined by what is called an array grammar. So array grammar is what? Uh, an archetype of that picture language or an algorithm to derive some concept of the picture language or formulae that is used by the picture language. All these are defined in array grammar. 
And this array grammar can be roughly categorized into three types, where you have the finite matrix column, the regular matrix column, and the context-free array column. A finite matrix column is a simple column which consists of single uh, distinct patterns. You don't see the same pattern repeating itself. So it's a simple column essentially, which has simple rules by, which are used to construct that column. Now you have the regular matrix column. A regular matrix column is a square or a rectangular column with repetitive patterns. This, again, is a regular matrix column. You see how the same fractal column now is used to explain something else, where this is the basic column, which when you repeat, you get a matrix of five. And you can repeat this n number of times to get a mat matrix of size n. This, this picture you see here is from a copy of the Arputa Kola Manjari, a column based a text on Kolam and uh, uh, other cultural uh, forms like uh, Gummi and uh, uh, such dance, written by C. Ammani Ammar, published in the year 1901. She explains, she calls this Kolam as Elimichangutte. It's also colloquially referred to as Anthlets of Krishna in other texts. Now, this is context free array grammar where you see that a basic column design here can be extrapolated into larger designs. This can be used to generate patterns. This column is called the Katrikol column. The Katrikol column can be extrapolated into larger Katrikol columns where you can see that this column and this column, the design is not the same like a reg uh, regular matrix column, but it has been adapted to this dot structure. That is context free array grammar for you. Now we have the concept of linear diagrams. This beautiful Ratna Kambalam, which looks so complicated, can be simplified into this linear diagram. You can see that each three by three square in this Ratna Kambalam is converted into this, where you see a pattern emerging as to what kind of a design this Ratna Kambalam is, what is weaved into it. Now this design can be converted into this simple archetype, which when you keep expanding and adding more rules of the grammar, you arrive at a column like the Ratna Kamala. So this is used to study pattern uh, picture languages, again, in the uh, field of computer science. Now we come to a very interesting part of the column, which is the ecological context in which the column exists. Now the Hindu sacred uh, text called the Manusmriti has laid down that one of the daily offerings for a Hindu householder is the Pancha Yajna, which is five uh, Yajnas or uh, 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 Pancha Yajna, which is five obligations that have to be fulfilled by a Hindu householder. One of them called the Prahuta means to feed all the created beings. Easier said than done when we look at beings as human beings only. So only the kings and uh, the rich were able to fulfill this. However, when you look at beings as all beings, the column helps you to uh, satisfy this obligation, where you use raw rice powder and draw on the floor and uh, insects and birds and other invisible beings and critters can also feed on the column. Then you have this beautiful concept where you, have a, you draw a column as a reverence for Bhudevi, the goddess of the earth. She bears our burden and the drawing of column makes, makes you commemorate that uh, sacrality of Bhudevi. So when you draw a column on the earth, you signify that, uh, signi uh, it is signified that the earth is sacred on the one hand. On the other hand, the same earth we trash and we, we throw garbage uh, and we do other things which are not really sacred. Now, it's a wonder how a mythological link to the earth need not, uh, it's not leading to a greater reverence to the soil in everyday life. Now, how is that? Because you think something is sacred, so you should have greater reverence to protect it, to take care of it. And at the same time, life also has to go on. So we all have our priorities, which is like a Bharatanatyam dancer pays obeisance to Bhudevi first, asks for forgiveness, and then the dance has to go on. Then you have the sacrality of the earth. You believe that 
the earth goddess or any of the goddesses, the river goddess, the earth goddess that you associate with nature, they have the power to absorb, to purify and to cleanse pollutants. So when you take a dip in the Ganga, it is believed that your sins are washed away with the river. Now this also makes, while the river, because you consider the river sacred, it makes people believe that they cannot destroy the soil or the waters, right? Who are we to uh, make the goddess impure? We don't consider that aspect, which is why the it, it becomes a paradox where we believe that sacredness prevents traditional Hindus from understanding that Bhudevi or G the Ganga or the Tulasi plant, it needs to be protected from us. Now, all of this context is largely uh, taken from the works of uh, uh, Ms. Vijaya Nagarajan, who has written extensively, who's researched extensively on the ecological context of columns. Now, how do we preserve this column as an art form? There are so many ways today that we see that the Kolam culture is setting in, it's becoming increasingly popular. It's done through oral knowledge transfer over the years of uh, all these, uh, through the centuries, we see that through observation and through oral knowledge transfer is how we have been able to retain the designs and the patterns and also a documentation of the know how and books. You see that precious, uh, almost always practitioners use uh, hand-drawn pattern notebooks. Uh, which I consider very precious today. There's also a change in the tradition organically with time, where you see that the kolam is used in other forms as well. You see block prints here. Then you also allow uh, the tradition to change organically. We have uh, so many printed kolam books here. Then you have, uh, of course, uh, kolam groups where people practice kolams uh, from their comfort of their homes through digital media. You also have contemporary applications like this is a column embroidered sari. Then you have uh, palagas which have been painted with column designs, ceramic. This is a tanjo painting with the Sri column, etc. Now here is the future of column. So we we how this organically happens is by observation again and through teaching and learning. You see young minds at work at a at a, a workshop in uh, Tenango, and uh, the wonderful part is that the gender narrative around the kolam, where kolam is traditionally practiced by women, this is slowly changing over time. You see that Mr. Naman is uh, posing with his padi kolam here, and so many boys are learning at this uh, workshop. Here is a young child learning a one stroke three by three column. So you start here and a one stroke column means that you end here too. Wow. Mm. Can I do one more here? Okay. Here it's very clear that you don't generally lift your pen, so it's practically uh, requiring a lot of experience to do the mm. same with the polar body <laughs> or the marble. Mm. This is how it happens. This can be extrapolated into bigger grids. Here are kolam practitioners who are practice who are adhering to the practice of drawing the kolam from around the world. You see Srimati Hema Kannan here from Mumbai with her spectacular Kartike Deepam special kolam. This is Srimati Kasturbai from Kuala Lumpur with her beautiful elaborate Sikka kolam. Srimati Shanti Seshadri drawing a Iyengar uh, Tirupindi here with lotus and buds and traditional designs. This is uh, Srimati Sumati, who has drawn another beautiful design of the kolam, which seems like lotus petals. It also have, bears resemblance to a Celtic knot. And then you have Srimati Vins Raj with the Sikh kolam in Singapore. And Sri Naman Bhav from Ahmedabad with his Padi kolam again. 
some of the references that I have used for this presentation. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge all the people who have been instrumental in enabling me to put this information together for you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining me in this wonderful journey through Polam into the realms of literature, aesthetics, rituals, computer science, and geometry. So I hope you will now concur with me when I say that Polam is indeed the perfect blend of art and science. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Janani. That was a really wonderful talk. Uh, we are now ready to take a few questions. I understand that uh, some of them are finding it difficult to type it. So um, you may now unmute yourself to ask a question if you would like. Mm, first of all, thank I you, Janani. We we delighted to have Ms. Leela Samson here today, and look forward to her inputs. Maybe we'll do that just after uh, the question answer. Welcome, Leela. Thank you, Sujata. Yeah, welcome, Leela. Thank you for this wonderful talk. But I think others should ask their questions first and then I'll come back. Yeah. So somebody was just starting. Can you go ahead, please? Uh, first of all, before I want to ask a question, I would like, I like the presentation in which she presented and how the way she e explained, Janni Ma'am. So I would like to thank you. And I asked in chat box, like, which is your favorite column? Thank you, Roshni. Um, I think favorite column is a very hard question. There are so many types of columns. So I have a favorite that is based on that time and that point of the, the mood at that point of time. Right now, I'll say that I'll, I'm going through a phase where I love Sikha columns because of the challenges that it uh, you know, uh, makes me face when I'm drawing the column. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So that is a question on uh, YouTube from mm -hmm. Soundarya Lakshmi. She says, a beautiful session, Janani, with Science Incorporated to Colum. Do you have plans to hold a class on Colum? I haven't really thought about it. Uh, there are actually so many uh, classes that happen uh, over uh, either YouTube or Instagram or Facebook. So for now, I think um, I'll probably join one of the classes to learn them myself. Thank you. Uh, how do you do that body column, uh, Miss Janni? Uh, the body column as in the column with the dry mix, is it? Yeah. So uh, if you see the video uh, of a sickle column that was presented during the presentation, you have to pinch the claw between your thumb and the index finger. And then you apply stress on that claw by slowly releasing it along the finger. So when you want to draw a line, you take the polar marker and you do this to get a line. It comes easily with practice. So you can draw curved lines like that. So when you press the mixture, the, the dry mix, it flows through this gap. And you can draw the, the amount of stress that you apply at this point will ensure, I mean, will enable the thickness of the polar, it decides the thickness of the polar. And you can experiment with polar puri your friendly neighborhood colibri <coughs> sellers, and you can try it at home on the floor. Thank you. Ma'am, there is another question in chat box, ma'am, that is there anything called floating column and all? Uh, okay, hold on, please. 
let me have a look i think the presentation will be available uh, on youtube so people who want to see a particular column can always go and uh, watch the presentation again so this is to answer the question can you show the rabbit column so uh, we have one question uh, mm -hmm. in andhra pradesh there is another column pattern called uh, nelungatta mugulu mm -hmm. which are drawn with the help of lines like pambu column can you please throw some light on that we have such patterns uh, of uh, snakes so intertwined with one another and uh, uh, an image that uh, kind of roughly looks like this with the snakes spiraling around each other yes we have such patterns as well it's there i remember seeing some in the arpuda kolamanjari text which is available as a pdf online Thank you. Nikla Balaji asks, um, where do the floral columns of Kerala and floating petals on water fit in in your classifications? Uh, well, uh, I'm talking about columns, so uh, I was only referring to this aspect of the column. Of course, there are different uh, regional variations, like I said, um, where you use colored powders, calling it rangoli, or you use flowers and call it pool column. and uh, you have uh, floating uh, flowers in uh, in the nurli all these are different types of kolam too today my focus was on the kolams as they are called in tamil nadu so i was talking about the podi kolams and the ma kolams thank you um we will just take a question from uh, youtube uh, sunayana chaudhary asks what is the connection with menstruation and kolam well traditionally it is believed that a uh, menstruating woman is actually not pure to do something which is part of the religious belief which is why she was not uh, she was not drawing the columns during that part of time if you ask me personally i would say it's each one's individual choice so if you uh, if you are going to follow the tradition then you do you follow the menstrual uh, separation and uh, that as well if you don't then i guess drawing the kolam makes no difference to you whether or not you are menstruating so it's a personal choice is what i would say thank you i uh, will take another question from one of the viewers on youtube ramya rajagopal asks any references or examples of isai kolam well uh, i'll have to probably work on that further i could not find any for now uh, i hope that some experts in the field of drawing column will be able to throw more light maybe for another session um, and actually there is a question from uh, zoom that kishan bavali das asked that is there any type of code Could you Before please? BCE. I'm sorry. Is there any any type of column that is before BCE? Before Common Era, that is. BCE. So if you look at the presentation, it is not called as column. So there are several yantrams and patterns that are drawn today, which are supposedly inspired by the patterns which existed in uh, 1500 BCE, etc. that answers your question i suppose uh shobana asks could you please explain or give references for how kolam is related to or extrapolated to architecture and space design well i'll probably tell you something from what i perceived in my travels uh if you look at uh, uh say uh, a place like uh, hampi where you have the raja's enclosure which has a beautiful step well that you can see in many films that step well if you look at an aerial view of the step well you'll be able to see the association between padi kolam and the step well i urge you to probably have a look uh just looking for it online as hampi step well and this is probably one of the first uh, visuals that you'll see if you can see an aerial view of that well you'll see that it closely resembles the designs of a padi kolam so i presume that at some point 
uh, when we didn't have CAD and uh, CAM to draw your patterns uh, and technology to enable uh, visualization of uh, architecture, I think these probably were techniques that were used, could, could have been used. Thank you. Lakshmi Devan viewing on YouTube asks, do you have any suggestion for the beginners who are aspiring to learn Kolam? Uh, yes, I do. There are umpteen number of books from which I, I'll probably talk from my perspective of, as to how I learned. Um, uh, drawing very simple patterns. First, I, uh, if you look at the presentation, you'll have different varieties of Kolam. So uh, have a look and see what design appeals to you. Then the simplest form of that design, like a three by three column, you can try doing different designs with that grid. There are umpteen medium of instruction, I mean, uh, umpteen uh, uh, means to see different designs, which you can draw on paper and then try to draw on the floor as a, a column. So paper design gives your muscle memory and then slowly uh, drawing it on the floor will enable your uh, fine motor skills as well to work in your favor to draw the column on the floor. Thank you. Is there any column design from, from the Vedic ages? Asks of you. Yeah, th this is what I mentioned uh, as uh, for, for instance, um, the yantrams that you see, some of them, some of the patterns that are drawn are apparently from the Vedic age, like the Sri Yantra, uh, etc. So I don't have too much information on this because I haven't uh, deeply researched this topic. Thank you. I think that brings us to the end of question answers. Um, Welcome, Leela, to give your observations. Namaskaram Janani and to all of you, um, this has been such a such a beautiful evening, well spent, uh, listening to Janani talk about something that we have all grown up with, but which we take for granted. Uh, it, it, it's a, a sadhana that is, uh, I wouldn't use the word disrespected, but a, a sadhana that normally is uh, not paid enough credence to by the common man. Uh, people come out every morning, uh, usually a maid these days, uh, and makes a beautiful poem with so much dhyanam, so much... Uh, uh, it, sadhana is the right word because it's kind of like a meditative practice. Just the body bent over with nothing else in view except this, what is flowing from her body through her hand onto the soil. Uh, it's such a beautiful, I, I think there's nothing, nothing that can compare with it. Uh, and yet while you were speaking, the things that came to my mind were actually dance. Because Ninga uh, uh, you know, the whole, you started with the idea of ephemeral. And uh, I've always felt that dance, uh, music is a step away. You can record it, but you could not, a performance, even of a child, is of that moment. Now people record it on video and cameras and all, but they were, when we were children, it was in the memory banks of our grandparents and in our, in our mother's smile when she would recall an incident, how the child behaved. So this movement that happens impulsively uh, from the heart, uh, you know, just you're not doing it for a result. You're doing it because you want to say something, want to do something. This is something that is so ephemeral. It's of the moment. Dance, I think, should always remain like that. It should remain of the moment, whatever. Uh, even when you hold a camera in front of you, you've lost it because it's another eye. What looking from your own heart into the heart of a dancer or a musician, mm -hmm. that is the only way that actually heals it, in my opinion. I may be wrong, uh, but um, the other thing, of course, that you talked about was the whole idea of spatial 
uh, contact, the whole idea of time and space, uh, which we talk so much in dance about. But we also work with on Bhudevi, with our naked foot. And uh, I've always disagreed with, uh, for instance, when we started dancing in historical temples like Khajurao and uh, the various temples, they, the, the temple authorities came up with excuses that dancers, when they, they cannot dance on, they would destroy the temple. And these arguments came up in Khajurao. And yet uh, units of soldiers would come to see the temples with their full uniform and guns and with their boots on and they would walk around, that was allowed. But a dancer, one single dancer with a, a naked feet dancing there for an hour was considered a sacrifice. So we have to uh, change our mindset about uh, how uh, how these things, the sacredness of them, what does it actually mean? Uh, we also work with our hands, the whole idea of communicating through the hands, the gestures, the mudras, has the mudras, uh, and that it involves intense concentration Yet it's something that is a soft power. It gives joy to the person who cares to stop and look. You look at it and you are filled with some kind of curiosity. There's an intelligence there. There's a, a beauty of line and form. There's balance. There's artham and uh, letting go. The soft and hard lines that you spoke about. It's the same in art. It's the same in, in dance movement. It has to be... Uh, we talk of it as Tandava, Lasya and all, but actually male or female body, when it is working, it has to have both aratham and gentleness, grace and power. And uh, it's the same with kolam, whether somebody puts a boy, puts the kolam or a young lady puts a kolam, uh, it doesn't make a difference. The other aspect that is so beautiful is the ritualistic part of it that it is done every day. People tell us, our teachers used to tell us, you have to practice every day, every day. Not for anybody, just for yourself. Uh, and uh, I thought that was so beautiful. I mean, it would be wonderful to write a little, you and I should sit down and write a, a little thing on the connect between kolam and uh, dance. Uh, but uh, the, the main things are what goes into any creative process. And that is, concentration, creative pro, uh, process, reverence um, for all life, um, uh, reverence for your own body. Uh, for us dancers, the body is the instrument. And how can you detach the hand or the, the hand that puts that column from the body, mind and heart of that person, Ilya? So it is the same thing. It's the, the body as the, as the instrument of creative process, as the instrument of creating beauty uh, and the connection of the five senses to the five elements, uh, the connection between Talam and I mean the five Panchajatis of three, five, seven and nine and how those go into weaving around a Chatushram. You know, I mean, it's just so exciting just, uh, but most of all is the, is the meditative practice. And for me in a world that is becoming uh, more and more selfish and self-oriented and, uh, where everything is weighed against money, I'd like to say that uh, the most beautiful thing about kolam putting is that, uh, or, or the practice of these kolam is that it's selfless and almost a part of you dies every time you put it. That's what we say that if a, a really beautiful artist uh, dies every time on stage. I think that's the most beautiful thing. Thank you so much, Janani, and to Jack for inviting me to spend an evening with you. Thank you so much for sharing your views. Thanks very much, Leela, for that wonderful insight, sensitive as always, and bringing home what we should realize. Thank you so much, Janani, for that wonderful presentation. I hope it stirred a lot of interest in columns in many people from this state and outside, and especially in the younger generation. So absolutely looking forward to more columns this Marguerite and later. Thank you all so much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you everybody for joining us today.